Well guys, GTX is back, but probably not in the way you or I might have liked. Nvidia has simply dug up the GTX 1650, a product that honestly wasn't great to begin with, and they've made it slower. Who is asking for this stuff? And just wait until you hear about the pricing. Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru and today we are taking a look at the new GTX 1630. Calling it new is probably a bit of a stretch however, as this is simply a cut down version of the GTX 1650 which launched based on the Turing architecture over three years ago. I think it is safe to say absolutely no one was asking for this, but here it is so we may as well take a look and find out if it is worth buying. Starting with a quick look at the specs then, GTX 1630 uses the same TU117 silicon as the GTX 1650, but it's just been cut down in almost every way. That means we find just 8 SMs, which gives a total of 512 CUDA cores, and that's a 43% reduction compared to the 1650. There's also 32 texture units and 16 ROPs, while the GPU has a reference boost clock of 1785 MHz. For the memory configuration, GDDR6 is standard, and we have 4GB of VRAM operating over a tiny 64-bit interface, and that gives total memory bandwidth of 96GB a second, a reduction of 25% compared to the G5 version of the 1650. One other thing not on that spec sheet that I do want to make clear is for the video encoder. So just like the GTX 1650, the 1630 actually uses Nvidia's 6th generation NVENC encoder, also known as the Volta encoder. This is unlike every other Turing GPU and even the newer Ampere ones, which use Nvidia's 7th gen NVENC encoder, also known as the Turing encoder. So we do have an older encoder with the 1630, something I wanted to make clear. As for our review today then, we're going to be benchmarking 12 different games focusing on 1080p gaming using either the low or medium quality presets. I've also swapped in a few esports or older titles which personally I think is a bit more relevant for this calibre of GPU. All of our benchmarking was done on our regular test system which is powered by MSI. This is based on the Intel i9-12900K CPU and that is paired with the MSI MEG Z690 Unify motherboard and we also have 32GB of DDR5 memory from a Data XPG. As for the drivers, I just want to quickly point out that all data you are going to see in this review has been completely tested from fresh over the last week. For the GTX 1630, we used the latest NVIDIA driver, which was 516.67. And then for all other NVIDIA cards, we used the 516.40 driver. And then on the AMD side, all cards were benchmarked with the Adrenaline 22.5.2 driver. Getting into the benchmarks then, starting with Cyberpunk 2077. Even using the low preset here, but with medium textures, this is just too much for the GTX 1630 to handle, as it averages just 28 FPS. That actually puts it half a frame ahead of the 1050 Ti, which is honestly a meaningless difference, but it is actually the only time where we will see the 1630 ahead of the 1050 Ti in all of our benchmarks today. It's a similar story in Dying Light 2. Again, the low preset with medium textures is just too heavy for this caliber of GPU, and we see just below 28 FPS on average. That actually puts the 1630 35% behind the GTX 1650, while the RX 6400 does even better, hitting over 50 FPS on average. F1 2021 is a less demanding engine, however, and on medium settings, the GTX 1630 is good for 72 FPS on average, which is nice and playable. It's still 16% slower than the GTX 1050 Ti, however, and it's about 38% behind the GTX 1650. 
As for Far Cry 6, this is another heavier title, and using the medium preset, the GTX 1630 averages 40 FPS. It's still a league behind the GTX 1650, however, which is good for 60 FPS in this title, while the 1050 Ti is still capable of another 5% on average over the 1630. Moving on then, we come to a new game for us, being Final Fantasy XIV using the Endwalker benchmark. This is a pretty old but still very popular engine, and we did see 60 FPS on average here, but with choppier 1% lows across the board. The 1630 is still rooted to the bottom of the chart too, and it's actually 24% slower than the 1050 Ti. As for God of War, using the original preset, which is the rough equivalent of the medium settings in this game, this is another one that's just too demanding for the 1630. We do see 32 FPS on average, but the 1% lows do drop below 30 FPS, so you would want to use the low preset in this game. Still, the 1630 remains 12% slower than the 1050 Ti, and 37% slower than the GTX 1650. Up next, we're bringing back the ever-popular GTA 5 for this review, and the GTX 1630 falls just shy of 60 FPS on average when using high settings. It is still considerably slower than other GPUs we've tested, however, but you do get a playable experience. Next then is Hitman 3 using the medium preset, where we're looking at 40 FPS on average, so you could get away with that sort of performance in this game. The GTX 1050 Ti only managed an extra 5 FPS, but then it is a big step up to the GTX 1650, which hits 66 FPS on average. Rainbow Six Siege is next, and here we're using the very high preset. But do remember, this is an old game, and the engine is frankly very easy to run, so we still see an average of 84 frames per second from the GTX 1630. That's actually only 7% behind the 1050 Ti, but honestly, I'm not quite sure that's a good thing for the 1630, all things considered. Up next then, we have Resident Evil Village, where the 1630 averaged 41 FPS using the balanced preset. This is actually dead level with the 1050 Ti, though again, it's still about 38% slower than the 1650, which was able to maintain over 60 FPS. Likewise, Total War Warhammer 3 is pretty heavy on the GTX 1630, even when using medium settings. We see an average of 38 FPS here, and that makes the 1630 14% slower than the 1050 Ti, and 35% slower than the GTX 1650. Lastly, we're closing out with another classic, The Witcher 3. Unfortunately, the trend is now very clear, and the GTX 1630 is right at the bottom of the chart. This time around, it's 18% slower than the 1050 Ti, and 37% behind the GTX 1650. After all of those benchmarks then, if we take a look at the average performance from all 12 games, it is pretty obvious that the GTX 1630 is a very weak gaming GPU, even at the lower image quality settings. Its average of 47 FPS is actually 14% behind the GTX 1050 Ti, and remember, that GPU came out in 2016 for about £140. The 1630 is also 36% slower than the GTX 1650, and frankly, we won't even mention the other cards we tested, including the 570 or GTX 1060, which are all miles faster. Let's change pace for a minute though and take a look at the card in question that we have tested today, and this is Palette's GTX 1630 Dual. This is a hugely diminutive card, measuring 170 by 112 by 40 millimeters, yet it still manages to retain a dual fan cooling setup with a pair of 80 millimeter fans. These sit on top of a single heatsink, while Palette is also using a black plastic shroud. There's no backplate, which we frankly wouldn't expect anyway, but 
strangely, there is a six pin power connector. This was honestly a bit baffling to me as the GTX 1630 has a TDP of 75 watts and it's locked at 75 watts. So you can't actually raise it in something like MSI Afterburner. So the PCIe slot alone should be able to deliver all the power that the 1630 needs. So I asked Pallet why they added this six pin and they told me that the power delivery is more stable this way, but I don't quite understand that as Pallet also makes a GTX 1650 with no extra power connector. And I know that works fine because I reviewed it myself. To me, this really just is unnecessary and actually takes away a potential selling point of the 1630 that you could use it as a drop in upgrade in a PC with no need for extra power cables, but I guess it is what it is. The only other thing to mention on the card then is going to be the display outputs where we get two DisplayPort 1.4 and one HDMI 2.0. Moving on to our technical testing then, in terms of its thermals, the Palette Dual model is absolutely fine. The only comparison I have here is the Gigabyte 1650 Gaming OC, which is a much bigger card, but I've not been able to test any other 1630s. Still, the Dual hits 64 degrees on the GPU and then 73 degrees on the hotspot, so absolutely no complaints from me. Those thermal results look even better too when we consider the noise levels. The two fans only spun up to 32% or 1100 RPM during our testing, resulting in absolutely whisper quiet noise levels. The card is actually so quiet that my sound meter couldn't detect a difference in the environment with the fans on or off, as 32 decibels is about the sound floor in my office. So again, that is a huge positive for the Palette Dual. Next up is going to be Power Draw, starting with Total System Power Draw, before we take a look at power from the graphics card only using Nvidia's PCAT. Starting with Total System Power Draw, then, as expected, this is very low at around 190 watts, putting it roughly level with the RX 6400. Bear in mind we are using an i9 12900K locked at 4.9 GHz, so you can of course expect to see even lower figures when paired with something like an i3. As for power draw of the graphics card only, despite being rated at 75 watts, we actually saw the average power draw from all 12 games we tested come in at below 50 watts. The 1630 is clearly very light on the juice and it brings me back to my point about the 6-pin power connector, which just looks completely unnecessary. The final thing I want to touch on then is going to be manual overclocking. As we already mentioned, the power limit is locked and can't be increased, but we still managed an extra 160 MHz to the GPU. For the memory, we added an extra 690 MHz, bringing speeds up to 13.3 gigabits a second, but trying to push things above that figure would result in the screen flickering and the graphics driver would reset. That overclock then saw the card's average operating clock speed increase from 1845 MHz stock up to 2010 MHz when overclocked, and that resulted in performance increases of 10 to 11% in the titles we retested, which frankly is not bad at all. Of course, it's hardly going to make the card suddenly hit 60 FPS in every game, but there is definitely some extra headroom left untapped. Overall then guys, being completely honest, I don't actually think the GTX 1630 is a bad product. And before you all start running to the comments, hear me out. So I'm very much looking at the 1630 as a replacement for the GT 1030, which is probably why it's been called the GTX 1630 to begin with. In that kind of viewpoint, I really don't think it's a terrible product. The gaming performance is decent enough so you can play older titles or esports games using the low or medium presets. The three display outputs is also decent and you do still get H.264 and H.265 encode even if the GPU isn't using Nvidia's latest 7th gen NVENC encoder. To me then, all of those things I think are genuinely fine. It's obviously not a gaming powerhouse of a graphics card, but to just chuck in a small media PC or HTPC for the living room 
maybe as an upgrade for a kid, I really do think it will do the job. That, however, brings me to the real problem I have with the GTX 1630, and that is the frankly ludicrous pricing. Here in the UK, I've actually only been able to find one listing for the GTX 1630, and that was a Zotac model on pre-order at SCAN for £180. And I will say that again, £180 for a GTX 1630. At this point, I really do just despair, and frankly, it makes me angry. This is actually more money than what the 1050 Ti launched for almost six years ago, and the 1630 is the slower product. I mean, Nvidia, just on what planet does this graphics card cost £180? It makes absolutely no sense. In fact, to make matters worse, Actual 1650s are in stock at the same price, if not a few quid less. And that product is almost 60% faster on average for 1080p gaming. After all of the launches that we've had this year, I can only come to one conclusion, and that is the low-end GPU market is broken. This is just another launch with absolutely outrageous pricing, and it just makes no sense to anyone. I mean, I can understand if NVIDIA is sitting on a ton of TU-117 GPUs and they want to release a cut-down model for budget buyers. But for that to make sense, this needs to be a £75 graphics card, not something that costs £100 more. In fact, I was looking on eBay UK and used GTX 1060s were going for £130, if not less. And there are RX 570s which can be had for about £110. Just how depressing is it that we are still recommending those cards for 1080p gaming in 2022? Honestly guys, I've had enough. Dominic here for KitGuru signing out. Don't buy the GTX 1630.